and welcome to Military History Inside Out, brought to you by War Scholar. We talk about military history from ancient to modern times and everything in between. I'm Chris Alvarez, and today's guest is Skip Finley, who talks about whaling captains of color and how whaling was involved with early U.S. military history. Thank you for listening. I'm speaking with Skip Finley, author of Whaling Captains of Color, America's First Meritocracy, to be published by Naval Institute Press, June 15, 2020. Thank you for speaking with me. Oh, thank you. I appreciate this. Even though this is a, a book about whaling, you know, since the podcast is military history, we will be focusing on the mili- how, how military history impacted uh, these individuals in the industry um, as well. That will be the focus of, of this conversation. Mm-hmm. So first, um, how did you get into studying and writing on this subject? Um, it's, a, it's a longer story. The short version, though, is um, after spending my career in radio, I decided to want to be a writer. Mm-hmm. wound up writing a column for the, a weekly column for the Vineyard Gazette about our town here in Oak Bluffs here in Martha's Vineyard. In 2014, the folks renovated the Charles W. Morgan whale ship. Um, it, it's the last whale ship. It's a you know complete historical you know restoration. And they brought it to Martha's Vineyard because so many of its of its whaling captains had been from here. That was a pretty big deal. And Martha's Vineyard magazine that our company, the Vineyard Gazette Media Group, owns, the editor asked me to write a an article about a black whaling captain here on the Vineyard named William A. Martin, which I did. And one thing led to another, and I was fascinated that someone black. And in, in his years, or like in the 1880s, had become a whaling captain. I was interested in how. You know, thanks to my, you know, ADHD and OCD, <laughs> um, before I knew it, I'd bought and written about a hundred whaling books, or pretty much all the books about whaling, to find out, you know, about this guy. And to my surprise, there were more. And before I knew it, doing all this research, I had... um. I wound up with a with a book on fifty two whaling captains, you know, happened to be people of color, mm-hmm. which is an expression I adopted because it really couldn't tell, you know, who was black and African American was not a useful metaphor, if you will, at the time. Mm-hmm. So tell me, how is the book uh, laid out? Do you go? Do you have separate biographies, or is it a chronological look at the development of the industry and how how things such as war impacted it? Yes. It's it's more of vignettes I would use as an expression, you know, about you know each of these guys, um, insofar as it describes the industry of whaling, which is which well, you know, nowadays, I think whaling in people's minds and imagination, you know, ranges from Moby Dick to the logo of Vineyard Vines, mm-hmm. the clothing manufacturer, <laughs> and there's a whole lot in between that people you know didn't know about, including myself. One was that how big a business it was. It was the third largest industry um, for close to 200 years in our country. Um, and this area, physically where I live in Montes Vineyard, um, it, Nantucket, New Bedford, and um, the ports of Long Island, were tantamount to the Middle East. You know, but it's a different type of oil, which they use for kind of different things. Hmm. In the beginning, they harvested whales, particularly sperm whales, because um, that was how folks, you know, which they use to make candles that didn't sit up the inside of your house, like tallow from other animals, hmm. for example. And over the years, this became more popular, and the wealthy class, you know, wanted to, you know, have as much light as they could. And it went from that to, you know, lighting streets to, believe it or not, lubricating the Industrial Revolution um, two ways, one financially, and the other one, in the most literal sense, they use it to, you know, to, you know, to oil the gears and machinery you know, of that industry. Hmm. And along the way, when whale oil was, was discovered, when shale oil was discovered, and they found it was easier getting it out of the ground and certainly less dangerous, hmm. the price of the whales, whale oil dropped. And the whales then went out hunting whales for their baleen, um, which is the material that hangs from the roof of certain whales' mouths used to allow them to, you know, to, to shift out the foods that they ate, the krill that they ate from out of the ocean. Mm-hmm. Um, and those, that material, baleen, was used just as we today use spring steel or plastic. 
Hmm. Okay. Um, you could heat this substance, and it would it would stay in the shape that um that it was that it was you know bent to, for example. So I was using umbrellas and boots and brushes and you know many other you know things until again steel, um, you know spring steel and plastic was discovered, hmm. which ended the whaling industry. Now along the way, more to the more to the point, um, the industry began in the late 1600s here in America, mm -hmm. um, but as an, in, as an industry, you know, meaning to, you know, purposefully harvest a product for sale for profit, it was probably more like around the late 1700s, you mm -hmm. know, early, mid, late 1700s. Um, so they're very, there's a very close parallel with the American Revolutionary War. Mm -hmm. The first known black whaling captain, for example, Paul Cuffey, uh, you know, began um, not as a whaler, but as a young kid who from, you know, Dartmouth, he and his brother would make boats and they would bring merchandise from Dartmouth over near New Bedford to Martha's Vineyard in Nantucket. When the Revolutionary War rolled around, Paul found himself captured by the British at a very young age. Mm. Twice, in fact, you know, which is incredibly important. But even more important was in those years, the British adopted the practice of impressing our sailors, mm -hmm. something they used in the Revolutionary War and in the War of 1812. And the American government, in 1796, um, passed a thing called the, the Act for the Relief and Protection of American Seamen, which is basically, you know, recording all of the persons who got on got aboard all ships, not you know merchant vessels, as well as whale ships. And each of these people were giving. A, a certificate called the Stevens Protection Certificate. Well, di directly related to my book, these certificates identified you by your age, your height, your complexion, where you were born, where you lived, and sometimes your eye color and hair color. And that was the principal way I was able to identify these folks as being people of color. By that, black, Native American, Cape Verdean, uh, people from the South Island Seas, you know, Africans, West Indians. Hence the difficulty, you know, in how to describe these people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, first, if you if you look at the expression African American, um, not all these folks are African. Maybe some had been brought here, you know, and and become slaves. Some were freed from slavery. Um, so if they were the African ones, but then there were the ch the children of African Americans and African American people who had had progeny, you know, with, with white people, for example. Mm -hmm. Well, what do you call that? They're just Americans. Mm -hmm. And then even further, how you describe those that are brought to the West Indians, <laughs> to the West Indies. Um, they're very difficult to identify as African American or in their second, third, fourth generation, either, either of the above. Mm -hmm. So I adopted the expression, you know, um, you know, persons of color because it was a it was a more apt description of who they were as they were typed in the semen protection papers. Okay. And um, did you met you said there were other individuals you wrote about who were impacted by um, the revolution? Paul Cuffey was the first. Mm -hmm. um, a, another one, you know, of a a you know very important one as well. William William A. Martin himself, you know, had a tie to the revolutionary period. His great grandfather, who was a man named Sharper Michael, was here on Martha's Vineyard. You know, when a uh, an, an English ship was, you know, went aground here, and of course, you know, they and the local people shot at them. Uh, and I think a ship was going to service, but um, Sharper Michaels was shot. He was the first person on Martha's Vineyard killed in the Revolutionary War. Hmm. You know, because you know because of that. Hmm. You know, interestingly enough. There was another one who was friends with Paul Cuffey, a sailmaker named James Fortin, um, who wound up in, like, like Cuffey, um, an early American millionaire. He was in the sailmaking business, um, but as a younger man um, from Philadelphia, he was also captured by the British, you know, and, you know, in jail for a while and ultimately, you know, set free. Mm -hmm. well, when they were prisoners, where did the British keep them? Oftentimes they kept them on British ships. That was their practice in those days. You know, they didn't return the ship back to land to put you there. They took you to, you know, to a jail ship, for lack of a better description. Hmm. Um, and they don't, they don't say specifically where they were. 
Um, but in years past, when from the from the Yankee privateering days, you know that was what happened. There were several other whalers were captured and taken to the similar type places. I'm speaking with Skip Finley, author of Whaling Captains of Color. You can find him online at skipfinley.com. Please rate this podcast on whatever podcast feed you're listening to it on. Your ratings go a long way in increasing the listenership of this podcast. Please sign up for my newsletter at warscholar.org or militaryhistorypodcast.com. Please post your comments about this podcast or the episode on Facebook at War Scholar or on YouTube at War Scholar 1945. You can contact me directly on Twitter at War Scholar or on Instagram at Chris Alvarez War Scholar. If you like science fiction, fantasy, and horror, please listen to my podcast, Full Contact Nerd, also located at chrisalvarez.com or fullcontactnerd.com. If you like outer space business, technology, and policy, please listen to my podcast, Spacewalks Money Talks, also located at spacewalksmoneytalks.com. Your support is greatly appreciated. Now back to the podcast. Jake Fortune was actually on a privateer when this happened to him, you know, not a whaler. Mm-hmm. You know, he and Paul Cuffey became friends ultimately because uh, Paul Cuffey decided he would take black people over to Sierra Leone um, where they would be welcome and to form their own country because they were so not well received here, here in America. Mm-hmm. Later on, a fellow named, you know, Richard Johnson, um, who wound up being a merchant and a um, married one, he was like the second husband of one of Cuffey's daughters, you know, so they were all contemporaries, mm-hmm. um, you know, was was also caught. Um, but his, his story was a little bit different, you know, during the war, in that he wound up becoming an owner, and as part owner of a merchant vessel he was on, mm-hmm. you know, was captured. A little further down the road, when the Civil War came around, mm-hmm. there were two very famous ships, the Alabama and the and the Shenandoah. Mm-hmm. These are very large, very fast schooners that the Confederacy paid the British to build on their behalf. And their job was to, you know, during the war, you know, just as the British had done, it was to attack American whale ships because so much of our economy was based on them. In fact, those two ships alone, you know, sank almost a hundred ships, most of which were whale ships. Mm. Uh, and for for a number of years they did this until they were finally sunk themselves. You know, but a whale ship couldn't get out of its own way. You figure, a, you know, an unladen one could do about eight knots, nine miles an hour. Mm-hmm. And one that was filled could only go two to three miles an hour. Mm-hmm. You know, with the, you know, with the men crew and the, you know, and the cargo of the, of the whale oil, you know, on it. So very easy for these ships to, you know, to hunt down, track down, catch up to and sink. Mm-hmm. Typically, they would order the crew off of the boat, um, you know, and onto theirs. They didn't kill them. They didn't kill the people. Um, but then they would set the whole burn, set the boat on fire, and let it burn right to the waterline. Mm-hmm. Some of the ships that they were, you know, you know, good ships in good shape, they would just keep, and they would hold these things for ransom that the government had to had to pay them for to get to have them returned. So, interestingly enough, several of the boats, three in particular of the ships that they sank. Uh, one was called the Benjamin Tucker, one was called the Nimrod, one was called the Jera Swift, were all built and designed by a black whaling designer, a whale ship designer named John Mashow, mm-hmm. who also sailed, you know, who built and launched several ships that several of my captains used, you know, which is, which is just, to me, mind-boggling. Uh, from my perspective was, I didn't know there was such a thing as a black captain, and now I'm finding out there are black people who own ships, whale ships, built, designed whale ships, mm-hmm. and sailed on them. Do you know what the uh, Confederates did with if they found, you know, black sailors on these whaling ships, um, what they did with they, them? Overwhelmingly, it seems, it seems they were treated um, just like any other crew. The first thing they would offer you was a job, you know, and come work for them. The second thing was they threatened to kill you. And the third thing, they put you ashore someplace, you know, or leave you in jail for whatever period it took. Mm-hmm. You know, that extended right through until the War of 1812. Well, then there's, a, there's another story, you know, for, you know, even further down the line. In 1918, one of our captains named John T. Gonzalez, 
you know, a, a Cape Verdean guy from New Bedford. Mm-hmm. He was on a whale ship, and a German submarine caught him. <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> which is, which I mean, just just such a fantastic story. Mm-hmm. Um, so he made them all get off the whale boat and into their whale, into their ships, into their boats. The captive submarine hadn't come over there, and you see, you know, pretty much asked them, you know, what the sh- they shot, they had fired a shot across their bow, but. You know, he asked the captain, you know, what are you all doing out here? Don't you know there's a war going on? Mm-hmm. You know, of course, they've been to sea for so long that they didn't know that. <laughs> which is another part of whaling I, you know, could get to. But he find, he wound up letting them go. There was another whale ship in the area, mm-hmm. um, and Gonzalez knew who he was and said that was another whale ship as well. And the and the, the German cap, sub-captain told him, you know, all right, you all get back on your boat, get the hell out of here, and don't come back. <laughs> so, did, so what part of, uh, where, where in the sea did that happen? I believe that I believe they were in the Pacific Ocean when that happened, and around 1918, more than likely they were um, the Atlantic Ocean whales, the sperm whales. People had given up on those because the oil wasn't worth as much, mm-hmm. and pretty much all whale whale sale whale product sales by the end, you know, of whaling, which is around 1928, 1926, depending how you look at it. Mm-hmm. Um, it was only for Belize. And those were, you know, generally these guys left from San Francisco, you know, to hunt those out. Okay. So were there any other individuals that you wrote about who's, who maybe their, their li- you know, their, their whaling lives weren't impacted by the war, but who had sort of uh, any kind of military background or, or ended up dealing with the military? No, other than, other than being caught. Mm-hmm. Um, another of those was a guy named, you know, Joseph, Joseph R. Lewis or Jose Lewis, mm-hmm. um, who was also captured, captured, you know, and finally let go. Mm-hmm. And that's which war? Um, they believe that it is believed he died on his whale ship after having been sunk by a German U-boat. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, you know, but but the the it, it was it, it was I mean, you know there, there's something about the the country that freed itself for freedom. Mm-hmm. You know, still had in in 1776, mm-hmm. still had slaves. You know, by 1865, being freed in 1866. Mm-hmm. You know, and for them in the early 1900s, when they were attempting to be assimilated post Reconstruction, throughout this entire period, there had been captains who who were people of color. Mm-hmm. It's, it's just it's just mind boggling, ex- the extraordinary that there should have been, you know, this hidden story. So, Even many of the new friends I've met in whaling um, are flabbergasted. And I've met, I've met now pretty much most of the leading people and researchers, you know, of the whaling industry, mm-hmm. um, which after mining was the second most dangerous, you know, in the country for all of those years. And everyone has, has the same response. It's like, you know, I can't believe I didn't know that. And how many were there? Mm-hmm. It's, it's a big question. But the answer is, I know for a fact they're 52 of, you know, deeply researched, was able to confirm through several sources. Mm-hmm. But there are another do- dozen in the book that I mentioned. And for whatever reason, typically the paucity of information, I couldn't prove either they were black or I couldn't prove that they were, had been a cap. Okay. Now, during the year between um, the American Revolution and the Civil War, I guess I'm trying to figure out the politics of um, using whale- these men of color as, as whaling sailors and captains um especially yeah. in the south where they i think i noticed in the blurb that the their skills outweighed sort of the racism that existed yes. uh can you talk about that a bit yes and there were and there were several factors that you know ah when you say you have that aha moment when you say it aloud um the first thing was the the average whaling trip was between three and four years mm. Okay, so if you have a crew of 28 to 36 people in very small quarters, you know, for that period of time, there's going to have to be a way for them to get along. Mm-hmm. You, you, you can't fight. A uh, whaling captor, a whaling master, as this term, you know, was, was virtually omniscient. He could do anything he want, wanted to maintain order aboard that ship. But fighting in that small space is not something that you could have. Mm-hmm. Now, often when I, when I say that, uh, you know, ships are, ships are nowadays described by tons for less than lay people who know the business. You know, so when you say to yourself that the, the Charles W. Morgan whale ship was 350 tons, that sounds pretty big. 
Um, but I was on that boat when they brought it here to Martha's Vineyard. Hmm. And the 15 minutes spent on it, I don't ever need to be on a whale ship again for the rest of my life. <laughs> All right, so you're talking about a, a structure that's maybe 100 and some, 100, 190 to 100 and some feet long, 110, 115 feet long, hmm. probably 18 to 20 feet wide, okay, with three general living areas that'd be very difficult to describe with, with, with anything but fascination and horror. For example, with the most of the crew stayed in the foxhole, mm -hmm. their quarters are roughly the size of the back seat of an SUV. Yeah. Now, if you can imagine being there for three and a half to four years, doing horrible, dangerous, and, and must have been the, the worst smelling work, you know, ever, mm -hmm. for generally low wages, long hours, uh, and terrible food. Mm -hmm. So, so, you know, once you say that, you know, and you combine, you know, the, the living conditions, the long length of times people have to be in, and stay on these boats, they really had to get along. They didn't have to be friends. They didn't have to talk. They didn't have to party together. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't a party. For example, um, flogging was not outlawed until 1850. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's past the heyday of, you know, of the, the big money, you know, in whaling. Mm -hmm. Captains were literally allowed, allowed to flog their men to keep them in line. Mm -hmm. You could be tied to the mast by your thumbs on a rolling, pitching whale ship because mm -hmm. you were bad or disagreed or talked back or got into a beef with one of your fellow crewmen. Mm -hmm. So after a while, you got to know them. Now, in the merchant marine, when you're going from point to point, or in the Navy, when you're going from place to place to place, you're not on that ship for that long. Okay, If you don't need for that level of... I'm not even called servitude, but you don't need that level of command on these ships. Mm -hmm. So it's far easier to discriminate against someone, you know, when you know in a month or two months or, you know, 60 days or, you know, three weeks later, you're going to be back on shore. You get to do what you want to do. Mm -hmm. Didn't work like that on a whaling ship. You know, one thing I, I traced down in book after book after book, um, you know, how these men were treated and what was, what was said about them, including use of the N-word. Mm -hmm. And you didn't find that too often. And, you know, using that word on the whale ship could get you killed. Mm -hmm. And no one would bat an eye. Mm -hmm. did, the, um, did the South have much of a whaling industry, or was it all in the North? The South had no whaling industry. Mm -hmm. um, and virtually all that occurred in the North, because once you get past the Mason-Dixon line, um, there were laws, rules, when you sailed into a port in Virginia, mm -hmm. you know, for example, um, the town or the state would have a rule that if, if you're black, you can't leave. You have to spend, you know, while the ship is in port, you have to stay in jail, you know, or if you're not allowed to get off the ship, mm -hmm. you know, so, you know, the, you know, the whale is like, you know, we can't have that. We need these guys, mm -hmm. you know, you know, what I'm the, um, the Richard um, Johnson I mentioned was what was called supercargo, meaning as one of the owners, his job was he was responsible for the cargo that we're bringing here to make sure the right amount gets off the boat and onto the dock and that whatever we've traded for or bought to take back gets back in the right amounts from the dock to the ship. Mm -hmm. You know, so they wanted to put this guy in jail while the people were in port and the rest of the white officers said, you know, absolutely not. That's not happening. We'll leave first. Right. Yeah. So people, you know, the whalers would not stop at any southern port unless it was an absolute emergency. It's a storm, we need water, you know, or whatever. Hmm. Paul Cuffey and one of his, um, one, one of his um, nephews, um, the, one of the waners, about the only two I could find that went to the south, and it wasn't for whaling trips, it was for, you know, using some sort of trade, mercantile trade. Mm -hmm. And the rest stayed clear. Well, during the Civil War, how did um, the South fulfill its its uh, its need for the the stuff that came from Wales, or did it just make do some other way? Do you know? They had to make do. Yeah, and I'd say you know the the peak years of whaling were probably eighteen forty to eighteen fifty, um, largely because whale shale oil was discovered in eighteen fifty seven. Okay. So if you if you could actually use that specific moment when it's easier to get oil out of the ground and as a as a red, as a better substitute, frankly. Mm -hmm. um, that was the point when the world changed for these guys. Okay. The other one at the end was when the French decided that those corsets that, you know, tightened up ladies' waists were no longer in fashion and they stopped buying the baleen. Ah, okay. 
So I'm going to turn to uh, how you did a, your research for the book, and you already uh, mentioned a few things, but are there any other um, uh, secondary, yeah. secondary issues that we haven't touched on that you might want to mention? Several. Um, surprisingly, you know, so, so subject to two fires, there's a fire in that type of, you know, in the 1800s, there was another one in, um, in um, Southampton, mm -hmm. and it destroyed their research and libraries, their information they had about whaling. But in New Bedford, the, the, the material they have is, is unlikely to have been recorded like it was. Mm -hmm. There were 15,913 total whale trips that used 2,700 physical boats. They were captained by 2,500 different people. 52 of them were my guys in the book. Mm -hmm. About 175,000 people ever went whaling, ever at all. And for most of them, perhaps as many as 90% of the people went whaling only went once. Hmm. That's how bad it was. Yeah. <laughs> okay. For the black, Native American, free people of color, they didn't have those options. You know, they couldn't be the, you know, blonde, blue-eyed kid romantically getting aboard a whale ship thinking he's going to make his fortune. Hmm. You know, and about six hours later, can't believe he's going to be throwing up for the next week and a half and turn green. Mm hmm <laughs> He knows he can come back and, you know, daddy's got a farm or a store he can go to work at. He can do something besides this, but I don't ever want to do this again. Mm -hmm. uh, most people in whaling deserted, again, because the conditions were so bad, mm -hmm. you know. So for the, the people of color who did it trip after trip after trip after trip, learned their craft. So when you're 1,200 miles out to sea and something happens to the captain, they look around who's left. They don't care who you were or what you look like. Mm -hmm. If you can get us home and catch more whales. You know, you know, fine, you know, you're the man, do your thing, be the cap. Mm -hmm. Now, those back to the city protection papers. So I read all these books, and, and um, I am kind of OCD. You know, I, I, in, every time I read, when I read all these books, I would make a note, use a little sticky note, you know, in the book. Um, and then, of course, I would, you know, take that information with a subject, you know, you know, speed of a whale, for example. Mm -hmm. I put all the stuff on a spreadsheet. Then I would go to the index, and as I had found captain's name before, see if any of these things were found in the index of the book so I could learn more about them. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, that very rarely occurred. Even in newspapers, when there was a picture of a black guy and an article about something that he had done, it never even says there that he was black. Okay? Mm -hmm. Because of all the people on the crew, when they're filling out these seamless protection papers, you know, when you first get on the boat, the captain didn't have to write himself down. He wrote about everybody else. Hmm, okay. But that information was recorded over the years at the New Bedford Public Library and at the New Bedford Whaling Museum. And uh, several people, you know, began to, to collate this information. Or specifically, a guy named Alexander Starbuck, you know, has a book which lists every whale ship, when it left, when it returned, where it went, who was the captain, who was the owner, how many whale barrels that they caught whale oil or sperm oil or, you know, or baleen. Mm -hmm. When he stopped doing it in, I think, 1872, 1873, then another guy, Haggerty, um, picked it up and filled in information out. A lady named Judith Lund, a researcher and expert in her folks, got together, and they took all of that data and they compared it with what they called the crew list, which is the list of all these people that they found that's stored at the New Bedford Public Library. So similarly, I found myself in the in the library of the New Bedford Whaling Museum, which back then was actually an entirely different building. Mm -hmm. And they don't let anybody in there. You know, you know, you have to be a researcher. And you know, of course, I explained I was writing this book, and I made friends with the librarian Mark Prochnik, mm -hmm. who's just amazing. I had I had so many questions and so little answers. You know, is you know, in, in some circumstance, you know, two folks in the room could both describe a mouse and an elephant, and they both have the same description. Hmm. You know, well, I was one of those blind people in this library. <laughs> and I said, well, I'm writing a book about black whaling captains. He says, oh, he says, yeah, you know, I know several of those. You know, we have about a dozen. So I said, dude, I got 46. And he's like, what? <laughs> you know, how in the world? Mm -hmm. Well, he pointed me, he says, you know, I was familiar with the crew list. I was not. Literally around that time, they had just put all these names and all this information, their race, their, their hair color, their eye color, you know, and things, hmm. onto a spreadsheet. Well, in my past life, 
you know, I was a broadcaster and, and, and I was a deal guy. Mm-hmm. You know, my, my job was to, you know, buy and sell radio stations, um, you know, and, and apply, you know, whatever financing principles, you know, and, and part of those was, you know, you know, using spreadsheets to model out if you bought a station doing X revenue with X profit for this kind of amount of time, what does it look like going ahead five years? And if that's true, how much can we pay for it? Hmm. So anyway, having all this experience, I saw that spreadsheet in my eyes when I opened and I, I thought I just died and gone to heaven. <laughs> so I data sorted is what it's called, this massive spreadsheet, hmm. and guys were jumping off of the page. Hmm. Now I could have these names to work from. I knew they were black. Here it is right there. Hmm. You know, So from those names, the New Bedford Whaling Museum does have a card catalog with captains' names. Hmm. I started there. In, and, you know, I exhausted that. Um, then Mark Kropnik said, well, you know, you know, we do have these, you know, old scrapbooks. You know, here's the information we have in those. And, you know, people, you know, who are proud of their dad or their grandfather or whomever gone whaling made scrapbooks of these guys. They donated them to the museum over the years. Oh, okay. So I was allowed access to read these things. Mm-hmm. And that's where you find, I found some of these wonderful stories. I'm speaking with Skip Finley, author of Whaling Captains of Color. You can find him online at skipfinley.com. Please rate this podcast on whatever podcast feed you're listening to it on. Your ratings go a long way in increasing the listenership of this podcast. Please sign up for my newsletter at warscholar.org or militaryhistorypodcast.com. Please post your comments about this podcast or the episode on Facebook at War Scholar or on YouTube at War Scholar 1945. You can contact me directly on Twitter at War Scholar or on Instagram at Chris Alvarez War Scholar. If you like science fiction, fantasy, and horror, please listen to my podcast, Full Contact Nerd, also located at chrisalvarez.com or fullcontactnerd.com. If you like outer space business, technology, and policy, please listen to my podcast, Spacewalks Money Talks, also located at spacewalksmoneytalks.com. Your support is greatly appreciated. Now back to the podcast. You know, like the one with, you know, I mean, you know, imagine, you know, a black whaling captain caught by a German submarine. Oh, my God. Yeah. You know, this is just amazing information. Mm-hmm. So, so anyway, that was the principal information. Now, they have a, the same thing in the, in the New Bedford um, Free Public Library. Back during, during the, um, the nation's depression. Mm-hmm. Uh, the government put people to work with these, you know, with these just, you know, busy work projects. Um, one of them was these folks, you know, were paid to go to the mu- to the museum and take these this crew list and to put all that information on index cards. Hmm. Well, the New Bedford Free Public Library has those index cards. So, of course, you know, the OCD and me, I went and read them all. By the way, there are 135 drawers. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> with a, well over 100,000 index cards. Wow. And I sat there for three or four days and read them all, and all the ones that had, you know, like some of my names and my captains or so they're black or whatever, I'd make copies of them with this cool scanner I, you know, I had bought. Mm-hmm. So armed with this information, you know, if I was then able to go through all the books that I'd read and bought, um, of course, it took several months for my wife to find, to find out I'd spent close to $4,000 on books about whale life. <laughs> <laughs> Because I was trying to find out how the hell this guy got to be a black captain. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, and, and that was it. And, and of course, that's how I met, you know, so many more people. Um, a friend took me to the Nantucket, the New Bedford Historical Association, a fundraiser they had. Mm-hmm. And, and I met several people whose parents or grandparents, you know, had, or, or grand nephew, um, grand uncles or whatever, had been whaling captains. Hmm. You know, through one of these, through one of these guys, you know, Bill DeCarmo, you know, in fact, he gave me a video that's all oh, three or four minutes long, which is literally, literally a video of the last black whaling captain oh, wow. talking about what it was like to be a whaler. Oh, wow. That's I mean, great. I mean, my mind was just absolute, absolutely plump. So it was fantastic. Um, and he talks about, you know, one of his first trip. In that trip, as luck would have it, Five ships went out whaling. His father owned the ship he was on. They had a terrible storm. 
one of my captains was captaining a ship in that storm and didn't come back, was killed. And he talked about this particular storm. It's just like, oh, come on, <laughs> you know. Yeah. It's like a little mini movie. I met another lady, and um, you know this guy who's in the movie, by the way. Um, she is the is she's his daughter. He has since died in eighteen uh, nineteen eighty nine. Okay. Um, but she's the last living direct descendant to a whaley cap. Oh wow! Yeah, that's yeah. So, I, <laughs> so you know, did you get, get a little overexcited here? No, that's cool. Um, did you get a sense looking through all these uh, records? Did you get a sense of anyone, any of these whalers, including your principal uh, characters? Um, where mm-hmm. did they? Were they trying to escape um, any kind of naval duty or anything? Were they um, sailors who were trying to get away from that or any went into that afterwards? No. To the best of my knowledge, in those years, you know, remember, we're talking about, you know, the 1700s to the early 1900s. Mm-hmm. Of, you, know, you know, these are not folks who were called to serve. Mm. These are people who were denied you know, citizenship, mm-hmm. much less serving, you know, one of our military vessels. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, there, you know, Martha Putney is a lady who wrote, you know, a very influential, very helpful book called Black Sailors. Mm-hmm. Um, she herself was a naval officer, um, left, went on to become a, um, a professor at Howard University and some other places. Mm-hmm. And she wrote this book called Black Sailors, which is just amazing when you see how few persons of color were called to serve. Hmm. Because I would think that even um, that they might um, use maybe former slaves or something for menial tasks, even on ships, because there's plenty, again, you know, being cooks. on a ship, you know. Yep. Cooks, cooks and stewards, you know, which includes whaling. There are many black cooks and stewards, just not all of them. Mm-hmm. Racism is one of those, you know, you know, one of those, you know, emotionally damaging things, yeah. you know, not not just for the person who's the victim. If yeah. you follow. Yeah. Yeah, I do follow. You know, some of these folks might have been great fighters. You know, you're talking about a lot of these guys couldn't read. Mm-hmm. One of them, you know, only captain, you know, one ship one time because, you know, he couldn't navigate. Yeah. But he was so good doing everything else. Right. Paul Cuffey may have been one of the best navigators, um, you know, who was self-schooled, homeschooled. Mm-hmm. He learned, you know, somehow through osmosis on his own. You know, I mean, if you can, and navigating ships at night to evade the British, mm-hmm. you know, in the 1700s, come on, I think that might have been a useful skill. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, the other thing is, of course, we didn't have a Navy to speak of. Right. Yeah. <laughs> the Samuel Philbrick's um, new book on George Washington, you know, lays that out in, you know, in, in, in extended detail. Mm-hmm. You know, how, how little ability we had to fight, you know, the largest, strongest you know, power on the earth, on the water. Mm-hmm. The the individual you mentioned who designed the whaling ship, did he, do you know if he designed other types of ships as well? He designed fishing ships and merchant ships. Mm-hmm. John Masho, yeah. And mm-hmm. he also was in the, um, in the mid to late 1800s. He was, he was a contemporary with the, with the civil war. Mm-hmm. Okay. And okay. three of his boats were burned during the civil war that he designed. Hmm. That's kind of painful, I'm sure. Well, other people, you know, he built them for other people. Yeah, but still, it's almost you know, like... So they weren't necessarily his. Yeah, he's paid. <laughs> right, but his babies almost. I wonder if he, you know, That's get right. word back. And, um... Right. There is, and I, 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 I just forgot the top of my head, but there is a model of the hull of the Jira, J-I-R-E-H, Swift, one of the boats he designed. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is still left. I mean, that's that's an amazing artifact. You know, shipbuilders that make a model, just like we do today. Mm-hmm. You know, you have, when you have your super, your super yacht built, you have a model made of it, you know, in your, in your boardroom. Mm-hmm. Um, but there is, there is a, a living call. I mean, could it be? It's, it's, it's in one of the more popular museums. I don't want to, I'm, I'm just forget which one off the top of my head. Hmm, okay. But it's a living, tangible, physical thing built, you know, when he built that ship, and so remains. Oh, wow, yeah. What part of the research was most enjoyable for you? Two. Um, I, I, I always loved reading. You know, I, when I grew up, I was sick. Actually, I skipped second grade because I was sick. And I started reading early, and I read really fast. Mm-hmm. Um, they clocked me 1,200 words a minute in the eighth grade. Of course, I don't read that fast now. <laughs> 
um, you know, at 99 plus percentage comprehension, you know, and all the rest of that stuff. Um, but I've always loved reading. Being induced to pick up these books about a subject I knew nothing about, the books are just fascinating. Mm-hmm. Some are better written than others, some I like better than others. There was one that's, you know, um, Geithner and Lewis in Pursuit of Leviathan. It's so useful, it has so much information, you know, detailed, and it's the type of information present in fashion that I'm used to, you know, kind of like a financial guy, mm-hmm. you know, about whaling. Um, but it has absolutely no heart or soul in it at all. Yeah. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a Harvard master's thesis, although I think it's University of Chicago. Mm. You know, so, you know, there, that was one that I loved and hated. You know, okay. they, they didn't mention anything about race in the entire book. Mm. You know, I mean, the guy who invented, you know, the, what's called the Temple Toggle, Lewis Temple, and they mentioned this harpoon, they don't mention his name. Mm. You know, so that that kind of flipped me out, rubbed me the wrong way. You know, how do you not mention, you know, John Master guy built 100 of these 2,700 boats, mm-hmm. you know, for as another example. But the information was, you know, was, was fabulous. Mm-hmm. The other Leviathan, though, by Eric J. Dolan, may be one of the best whaling books I've ever read. And, by the way, that includes Moby Dick. <laughs> yeah. You know, <laughs> he's, it's... It's fascinating, it's interesting, it's all the facts, but it's, in, it's, it's like a story, you know, of this industry. And, and you know, it was fascinating. He's, he was very helpful to me in the book. Mm-hmm. Yes, I love that. So I said, so first is, you know, reading the books, I just, I just went one from another. I couldn't wait for the Amazon, you know, delivery, mm-hmm. you know, coming through here. The other one was, though, the spreadsheets, you know, the, the, the fact that, you know, the, what, what historians and researchers and librarians do, the spreadsheet, you know, um, they built them. But it, it takes, you know, that kind of financial way of looking at it. You know, the, you know numbers, I'm a numbers freak. Mm. I really, really like that. I still use that, you know, up, by the way, that, that crew list is now online at the, um, you know, New Bedford Whaling Museum, so anybody can look it up. Okay. It does help if you're grounded and have, know what you're looking for. There's right. a lot of information. Yeah. Having said that, I learned some other things about research that I didn't know that threw me for a loop because, yes, I read 100, probably, I, you know, if I said 1,000, you know, online things, you know, you know, Googling stuff, I, I wouldn't be lying. I, it, probably not 1,000, but it was a whole heck of a lot. <laughs> Wikipedia is not a useful source. <laughs> I was not allowed to use Ancestry.com, and I was not allowed to use Wikipedia okay. as sources, you know, in a nonfiction book. Right. Uh, my editor, I'm like, you know, what are you talking about? She said, no. And when you cite a website, mm-hmm. you know, you have to cite, you know, you know when, it, you, when you saw it, because that's not necessarily when it was published, mm-hmm. um, the headline of it, the name, as well as the HTTPS, you know, you know, wherever it is. Mm-hmm. You know, to use that as an official source. Yeah. yeah. So that was pretty interesting. And and when you're trying to find information out about people without using Ancestry.com, it's mm. really tough. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. Huh. And then I'm Googling That's people important. whose names no one knows. Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Until now. So you mentioned a few... Um difficulties that you had in doing the research, but is there any particular question or issue that you really wanted to get an answer about that you still don't have one? Or maybe you do, but it just took a lot to, to get there. It, it took a lot to get there. And it was the very basic ones, the one I'm asked the most often, you know, was, you know, how did you get to be a whaling captain? And the answer was, you did over and over and over and over again, a job knowing what to, wanted to do. And you became adept at it. And when things went downhill, you're the one standing there. Mm-hmm. You're the man, man. That's... And, and it, was, it was despite who you were, you know? I mean, you know, again, this is, you know, before, this, this is when whaling started before America was free. Mm-hmm. And continued until well after Black people had been free. Mm-hmm. You know, you're talking. You know, you're talking to 220, 240 some year enterprise. Mm-hmm. The overwhelming time of which these folks were discriminated against mm-hmm. on land, not out there in that whale ship. On the whale ship, there are many God. Hmm. 
Yeah. And then but and the other thing, you know, they're not all heroes. Some were better than others. Mm-hmm. Some were not good captains. Some were not good navigators. Some were not good managers. Mm-hmm. You know. Um, so yeah, this is, you know, it's not that time. You know, this is this is what it is. I'm still fascinated by them all. Mm-hmm. One of them, one of the last ones, was an outright scoundrel, which is, you know, you know, kind of refreshing in a way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Was there anything you discovered that had a strong emotional impact on you, either positively or negatively? Yes. I didn't know how important Nantucket, of all places on the planet you even conceive of, mm. was to freedom. I had I had no idea, and it's and it's relative whaling. Uh, the the short story there was a fellow named Prince Boston who was a slave. Mm-hmm. Um, back when Nantucket, then you know you were allowed to to rent your slave out to go to work on a whale ship. Mm-hmm. They said he didn't get paid, you did. Well, Prince Boston went out on a on a trip. He did so well that the captain said, "No, I'm paying you." <laughs> now the captain and the owners of the boat happened to have been Quakers who founded Nantucket. You know, Quakers are the original abolitionists. They believed in freedom. They didn't believe in slavery. Mm-hmm. You know, they didn't want to have that. So this, so this owner says, you know, no, no, no. You know, I'm paying this guy. And and the slave owner, Boston's owner, says, you know, he know that's nonsense. I'm taking that money. You know, I'll take it to court. Guys, says, let's go. We'll go to court. You know, I, I think it was John Quincy Adams, one one of the our presidents. You know, the Quaker said, well, he's my boy, and he's going to take this case. Mm-hmm. And the guy gave up on it. Um, this is in 1762. Hmm. And uh, around this issue, the original slave owner died. His son wound up, you know, um, providing manumission, you know, for the rest of his slaves as a result of this instance. Hmm. You know, by that, it's like, you know, you know, well, I'm going to keep your slave till you're 22 or 23. After that, you're on your own. You're free. Mm-hmm. So that was the first thing. His great nephew was a fellow named Absalom Boston, who was one of the first black whaling captains mm-hmm. um, on Nantucket. You know, went on to you know be rather successful. You know, in the wealthy and you know you know through you know his his whaling abilities. Mm-hmm. But in 1763, Nantucket outlawed slavery. Mm-hmm. In 1783, the state of Massachusetts outlawed slavery. I had no idea. Wow, yeah. I had no idea that this was happening. So that was a very powerful story. And between that and between those two times, what occurred was um, there were five black whaling captains on Nantucket, one of whom went on to be, uh, you know, a salesperson for the Liberator. Hmm. Okay, these are people, you know, who met Frederick Douglass when he first spoke you know, as an orator on the island of Nantucket. Oh, wow. So, so I mean, uh, you know, um, these guys, you know, knew each other. You know, the Paul Cuffey. Mm-hmm. You know, Paul Cuffey, same time over in Dartmouth, south of New Bedford. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, his kids weren't allowed to go to school, so he built a school and let white kids come also, and this became the first integrated school in the country. This is all before, <laughs> you know, this is 100 years literally a hundred years before the Civil War, this was going on. So so that blew my mind. I, you know, I, I had to be terribly honest about that. Not to, you know, the fun stuff, how bad it was, was frightening. Right. So it makes me wonder, um, was this the, you know, just thinking to the Civil War, and Fre- you know, you're talking about Frederick Douglass, I wonder, was this industry, were, were men of color able to achieve their highest success in life in the country, in this industry, at this time period, I haven't researched everything, and I, I so I don't know. But I think it'd be very difficult to disprove that. And it makes me all right. You know, and another tie-in. You know, when Frederick Douglass escaped slavery in Maryland, he was working at a shipyard, mm-hmm. and he borrowed another another part of black guys, um, seamen's protection papers, mm-hmm. to escape to go to work in New Bedford. Okay. Yeah. So, so I would, I would, I would. That'd be. That'd be de- I, I cannot think of another industry where that many people, you know, became successful or were in the path to become successful or were allowed to become successful. In fact, I also, you know, kind of thought through the use of the word meritocracy, mm-hmm. you know, which is which is just perfect for, you know, what they were. And the next closest thing to merit- meritocracy may be the NBA. Mm. 
because yeah, I make that fun you know, to be funny, but <laughs> no, no, I I understand. So it just makes me. There, but there have been many people who from who from the, the the fruit of their labor, the talent and their gifts were able to become successful. Mm -hmm. um, but here's a whole industry, man. Yeah, it makes me think that it's worth researching for someone to research sort of the roots of of black freedom and the Civil War and all from this industry. You know, if you see, hey, we're allowed yeah, to get I, ahead, you know. I have this, there's several books that, you know, that talk about that. Um, um, there's a guy, Professor Foner, what's, what's, I forgot what, it, what it's called, but there's, there's a book called Black Workers. Mm -hmm. uh, a bunch of these books, by the way, not just railing books, these are books that included these people, mentioned them or talked about them. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's one, um, um, the fugitives of, of New Bedford, uh, no, I'm forgetting the names. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to actually say, so I, you know, look them up. Okay. But yes, there's several economically based, historical based books about people of color and how successful they were in various enterprises. Mm -hmm. You know, there are several of those. That's not something that's difficult to research at this point. Okay. Largely because there were so few. Uh. But some of the impediments, you know, of, of whaling, um, you know, you know, one, you know, paucity of, you know, you know, real research, no pictures, mm -hmm. you know, photography didn't occur to him. Well, it was almost over. It's in his heyday. Well, I guess about 1840s or something, mm -hmm. you know, so you don't have, you know, photographs of them. You know, yes, there's a few paintings. Absalom Boston is one. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, but, you know, black in the 1800s, you weren't having your picture painted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was going to ask about paintings, you know, maybe if there yeah. was an individual in a background or something, I don't know. Right. Yeah, my book has forty-one pictures um, that the several museums, you know, have you know provided me with, and, you know, let, and let me use. But there weren't that many to select from. Okay. You know, putting you know, pictures are expensive to put into a you know to a book, especially an historical book. Right. But that, and I was saying, there just are that many available. Mm -hmm. So, apart from filling the historical record, um, what do you hope the book will do? Well, I hope it, I hope it becomes a bestseller. <laughs> <laughs> So, but if you, if you take the two concepts of black people and whaling, you know, that's, you know, that's not a likely occurrence. Um, but there was a movie called Hidden Figures um, that blew me away. Um, my wife and I went to see it, and I'm sure you're familiar with it as well. Right. You know, the, 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 you know, the astronauts and the, the mathematicians of the astronauts. Mm -hmm. And um, Kat, my wife Karen and I, we left the movie, we were halfway home, and I, it occurred to me, like, how the hell do I not know this? <laughs> huh. you know, I was in high school when that happened or college or whatever mm -hmm. how do I not know this story when John Glenn pretty much said you know if that lady's not doing the numbers I'm not going <laughs> you know so there, there is that aspect to it mm -hmm. you know but you know the you know space is a little bit closer <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> rhetorically he said yeah. um, than whaling is to us today so you know it might not have that much you know that much interest um, but the fact that these guys are whaling captains is, you know, to me amazing. But you know, I've made a hell of an investment in this now. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Now, so you look. I, you know, I hope it does well. You know, like I like to talk about it. Um, I have had an absolute ball doing this. You know. You know, and I hope I hope people see it. Uh -huh. I was so fortunate to get a publisher, even. So yeah, I want to ask. Um what difficulties did you have in finishing the book apart from the research and all the material um, and getting it published? Well, I was not able to get an agent interested and you have to have an agent to get published. Mm -hmm. But I met this lady, uh, Carol Sargent, who works at Georgetown University and her job is when you use the expression publish or perish was to teach professors how to get, you know, their tome, you know, published, you know, in some place. Mm -hmm. And I met her here in Mars Venus we got to talk and I told her what I was doing and she was as fascinated as everyone else. I said, well, let me see if I know somebody. So, you know, we made an arrangement um, and she knew the editor at the time of the Naval Institute down there in, in Annapolis, Maryland, mm -hmm. who said, I'd love to do this book. So I did. And then, you know, you know it's, it's, my, it's my first, you know, you know nonfiction book. Mm -hmm. It's my first real book. You know, put it like that. I've written a couple of other ones. So the day I submitted the manuscript for the first time, it was kind of a funny story. I, I actually emailed it, you know, uh, to Laura DeWillis, who was the editor then. And in the email, I said, you know, by the way, you know, how long should this book be? Mm -hmm. 
you know, and what I sent her was 160,000 words, and she sent me a note back, you know, oh, about 70,000. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> yeah. so, you know, that wasn't too funny when I read that email. <laughs> you know, and we talked, and, you know, she said in no uncertain terms, she said, you know, look, you're not writing the Bible. It's a book about 50 black guys. <laughs> yeah. So you had to try. So I had to do some, I had to do some editing. Yeah. Um, I shared, you know, it was with my new friend, you know, Eric J. Dolan. Mm -hmm. uh, and, he, and he actually read it. He sent me a note back. He says, has, has your editor, has this been edited yet? So I said, no, no, this is what I sent them. He's like, no, hell no. <laughs> this is all wrong. And what I had done, just because there was so much information and so much data, mm -hmm. I'd organized the book by the year that the person became a captain and brought it up, you know, up, you know, forward, starting with Paul Coffey in the 1700s and works forward. Mm -hmm. You know, well, it didn't have a trend line. It didn't have a theme. It didn't have a, any of those things that, you know, you would want if you're picking up, you know, a book about whaling captains. Mm -hmm. And it's about whaling captains. You know, the whole first part of the book should not be about how bad whaling was. <laughs> so, so Eric pointed these things out. And then I realized I needed a, you know, real editor. So mm -hmm. um, my, my boss's husband, my, my boss, Jane Seagrave, the publisher of the Vineyard Gazette, um, I worked for her first writing column, and now I'm the director of sales and marketing. Um, met her husband, and he's written a book about black golfers. He's not, but he's written a book about them. Mm -hmm. And I asked him if he would help me. Well, it turns out he also teaches journalism. So he's been my editor to, you know, make the, make the book read like a book in okay. an order that makes sense. Okay. And then finally, um, the folks, Caitlin, the folks at the Naval Institute, you know, put their imprimatur on, you know, well, you know, this should maybe be here and this should be there and everything. And, you know, it came out to be a much better book than I had written on my own. Hey, I think, I think every writer undergoes that. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, fortuitously, um, as, as my boss says, that's not how I keep score. You know, I already had a career I was pretty good at and pretty successful at. So, you know, <laughs> I just wanted to be a writer and now I can say I wrote a book. So I feel good about that. It's getting published. You know, I'm happy. Oh, yeah. You know, at the end of the day, if nobody reads it, that's fine, but just please, please go buy it. And if you can't <laughs> pre-order it now on Amazon, because they say that that first week's sales count whatever pre-orders that you have. Oh, okay. okay. And if I get lucky and get on some list and everybody sees it, you know, then that'll be, that'll be great. Oh, yeah. Considering what you just said, do you have a, another writing project in mind, or are you pausing for now? Um, I'm, no, I'm not pausing. I... <laughs> I'm work. I've, I've been instructed already. I, I, I will, I've made friends in the media since I've you know been in the media myself. You know my whole career. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to write another book, but I do have another concept. And what it is is I want to. It's a treatment, and it's about a slave who becomes a whaling captain. Okay. And what's going to be a little bit unique is I'm going to be able to put him on a lot of already famous real whale ships and trips mm -hmm. where interesting things happened along the way. Oh, okay. Um, of course, that'll be non. That'll be fiction, and I have no experience doing that. So uh, I'm gonna have to. I, I want to do it in in a. Here's a story, mm -hmm. not a book or something, and maybe this is a treatment. Maybe it's a, a documentary or a TV or a Netflix or something like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know? no, I get it. So where can people find you on the web? Do you have a website, social yep. media? Skip at skipfinley.com. Okay. Uh, F I N L E Y skip at skipfinley dot com, okay. and it's got you know about my my writing. It's got some photos and pictures. Um, it's it's got some articles and other interviews you know that I've done about the book. Okay. Um, yours will be in there as soon as you're ready to go. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm a marketing guy. I mean that that's been very helpful. You know the you know the things I'm I'm not getting my you know my knickers knocked up over you know things that are just are immaterial. Yeah. Um, I did this because I wanted to, and I did it because it was fun, and I'm I'm just delighted to be so fortunate to have accomplished this. Oh yeah, no, definitely, it's a pretty awesome accomplishment. Um, I think a lot of yeah, something that a lot of people want want to be able to do. Um, and some and some of the other folks that I've met, you know, you know, folks who 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 reviewed my book, you know, Nathaniel Philbrick. I mean, like the Nathaniel Philbrick. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. You know, with the history of the whale ship ethics. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Eric J. Dolan, um, Philip Hoare, who people don't know, but his was his book, The Whale, 
um, may be one of the best-selling books about whales after Moby Dick. Oh, really? Yeah, and I met him. He's an amazing man, <laughs> just mm. amazing people. Um, and, and Skip, you know, Dr. Henry Skip Gates, you know, read and, you know, wrote a blurb for my book also. He's a mm -hmm. vineyard friend of mine. Okay. Um, but, you know, that's pretty high cotton for, you know, for, you know, a guy like me, hard-working media type. Hey, hey, you work hard, you get the rewards, yeah. right? Yep. Yeah. All right. Um, well, that's all the questions I have. Do you have any final thoughts or words? Please get the book. Yeah, my, my thanks thanks to the coronavirus, my road trip has been you know a little bit curtailed at the moment. Mm -hmm. I was to have been speaking at the Nantucket Book Festival in um, mid June, mm -hmm. but I'm going to be there at a book signing in July. Mm -hmm. At the moment, I'm scheduled for a, a book signing in um, in Washington D.C. Oh, okay. you know, where I used to live. Oh. I don't you know politics and prose. Yeah. I'm going to be there doing a book signing, you know, in July as well, depending on how long this thing takes to roll. Right. Yeah. Uh, but I'm so excited. It, um, standing back for myself, my ego, you know, just for a second, it's a very good book. I, I know how that sounds coming from the writer, <laughs> but I write a lot and I read a hell of a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I pick this book up again and again and again and again, you know, wake up at night like, well, wait a minute, did I include? Yeah, of course, it's in there, mm -hmm. you know, five, six years later. Um, but it, it's 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 a very readable book. It's very educational. People will be surprised by what they see in it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some is some is fabulously exciting, and some is oh my god, how they do that. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think yeah, it's it's an incredible subject. Like you say, just whaling is just yeah. That's that's it's out the box. That's for sure. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> When they were making boxes, they didn't even think to put this in it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, all right. Well, thank you for speaking with me. I do appreciate this, Chris. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening. You can find more podcasts like this on your favorite podcast feed under the title Military History Inside Out. That includes Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and Spotify. One great way to support me is to rate my podcasts, either good or bad. You can find more great military history information at warscholar.org, on YouTube at warscholar1945, on Facebook at warscholar, on Instagram at Chris Alvarez Warscholar, and on Twitter at warscholar. Please support me by following me on those sites and liking my videos. If you like to read, don't forget to sign up for my weekly newsletter where I recommend newly published books. The subscription box is on my webpage. Thank you.